Hi everyone, Kay Bergner here today with Dr. Tom Phelan, author and creator of 123 Magic and the author of The Manager Mom Epidemic. Dr. Phelan, welcome. Good morning, Kay. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. It's getting a little chilly around here. I know. It snowed for the first time last weekend. I was not was not excited about that. I'm not ready for winter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we will do our best. Um, so speaking of doing our best, today we are talking about tantrums. Obviously, tantrums are a thing that a lot of parents have to deal with. They are a perfectly normal thing. If your child is having a tantrum, there's nothing wrong with the child. There is nothing wrong with your parenting. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it any easier to handle in the moment. So Dr. Phelan, I was hoping that you could start out by talking to us about sort of what is a normal frequency of tantrums at different ages? Yeah, the, you think of the tantrum years, if you want, as being about a year and a half, 18 months, on up to about five years. We like to see the tantrums diminishing after about five years. Uh, but the, it's the preschool ages are, you know, favorites for tantrums. And one statistic I always like is that about 20% of two to three-year-olds will tantrum daily. So at least, so you can, I've seen parents, they come in, their kids tantruming five times a day, they're three years old um, and so on. So they're very normal for that age, age, age group, even though they're very, can be very upsetting. Absolutely. And, and is there an age at which um, parents might want to be concerned if, you know, sort of daily tantrums are still happening? Is it five, six, seven? Up to yeah. what age? If you were getting past five, uh, you know, and you know, four and a half, five, and you're still dead, getting daily tantrums, then you might want to be concerned. There's a couple of things that you can be concerned about, though. You mentioned, I think, before implied that, uh, you know, does this mean my kid's uh, mentally ill? And it, it certainly does not mean that your child's mentally ill. You know, it's not a good sign. But the other thing is, a lot of times the tantrums will continue because the parents don't know how to handle it. Uh, and if the kid gets what they want out of the tantrums, either they get their way or they get effective revenge, then the tantrums can go on, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, uh, even into the teenage years. And that can be very upsetting because these kids are big now and they're getting scarier uh, once they get be about as big as you are. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're going to talk in just a second about uh, sort of what parents can do about this. But could you just describe for us briefly, like, what might a tantrum look like? Do all tantrums look the same? Um, you know, and how, how does a parent know the difference between, you know, my child is whining or or perhaps has started raising their voice and, and when to deal with something as sort of a full-blown tantrum? Yeah, tantrums, really, when we use the word tantrum, we're often thinking of uh, physical aggression. Uh, and that can be, it can be yelling. Uh, it can be physical for little kids. They can throw themselves down on the floor, yell, scream, bang their head, bite their arm, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it's very physical. Some kids will attack other people. They may attack siblings or they may attack um, uh, their parents. And that's a worse sign. If you get physical aggression directed at other people, we don't like to uh, see that. Uh, other kids, you know, if you're whining and pouting, that's not really a tantrum. It, it is an expression of frustration. Uh, but it's not a uh, tantrum. It may be something the parents have to um, deal with. But the tantrums are everybody thinking about, uh, you know, a fairly aggressive behavior, either verbally or physically. Got it. And so why, why do children have tantrums? What is often setting children off? Well, it's a combination of they're too young to have much emotional control. Uh, and the other thing is that they are frustrated. I always tell parents, think of it as, you know, the child didn't get a thing that they wanted, like to play with your iPhone before uh, dinner, or, or they didn't get an activity, you know, wanted to, they want to go outside and play or whatever, and it's too cold, uh, or something like that. Uh, or you want them to do an activity that they don't want to do, like go to bed. Uh, so think uh, thing, thing, activity. It's a request either from a kid, uh, or it's a request from a parent and the parent didn't give the child what they wanted to. So those are, when, you, when you're into the request mode, you know, they're asking you for something or you're asking them to do something, that's when you wanna kind of be on guard. Okay, this is potential tantrum territory. Yeah, and speaking of being on guard, so then what can parents do to prevent tantrums before they start? The first thing you wanna do is if you, if you are gonna say no, 
uh, to a child, uh, you have to do what I call a good veto. I mean, you say no. A good veto is short, gives one explanation if absolutely necessary, and it's followed by silence. You don't get into an argument afterwards. The other thing you can do, which sounds kind of silly, but if a kid makes a request of you, can I have a cookie? Give him the cookie. If it's 3.30 and dinner is six o'clock, give them the cookie at 3.30, you know, and, and, and so on. So if you can, uh, give them what you want, but you can't always, obviously, give them the activity or give them the thing. Uh, but the, the, the next step is doing a good veto. If you say no, mean business, right? calm and decisive. Got it. Yeah, and I, I feel like the, the reminder that, that you actually can say yes to the request of a child is a good one. I know I sometimes... Um, have a tendency in our own house to, you know, request like, can I have a piece of candy? Can I have a cookie? Can I do this very messy activity that I'm going to spread out all over the kitchen table? Sometimes my knee-jerk reaction is to say no to those things, um, when in reality, this may be a situation where you can say yes. So I know that at our house, it's been helpful to remember to kind of pause and consider like, can't, oh, can I say yes here? That seems, that seems great. That's right. You don't want to do a veto just because you're in a bad mood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously it would be terrific if we could always prevent tantrums before they happen. And equally, obviously, that's not very realistic. So what steps should a parent take once a tantrum has started? What should they do? The first thing you want to do is think clearly. And what you want to think is that, as you said before, tantrums are normal. Uh, and tantrums usually come from good parenting. It means a parent setting a limit, not giving the child something that they want. And that helps a lot for you to be calm and decisive. The other thing you want to think of is once the kid blows up, you have 10 seconds to make up your mind what you're going to do. And the reason I say that is if you fumble around for just 10 seconds, you will reinforce the tantrum. If the child feels like, my, my mom or dad has no idea what they're doing. <laughs> that means I may get what I want, or I may get them, I may punish them effectively for not giving me, giving me what I want. Uh, and so what you want to do then is 10 seconds, you're either going to check out, means no eye contact. Don't. One of the worst things you can do is talk to a tantruming child. And sometimes with some kids, you can also consequence the tantrum and separate from the child. Those can be the same thing. So sometimes the kid's tantruming, you leave the room and you leave your two-year-old on the middle of the floor and they scream and yell, they're safe, they're okay, you don't have to stay there. The other thing, you have a five-year-old, they're tantruming, <clears throat> maybe they go to uh, their room for break time or rest period. Uh, some parents will say tantrums are for the room and uh, when you're done, you can come out. And then we forget the whole thing. Yeah, and I think that that piece is really important um, that, that once that break period is over, we're not then having a long conversation about why we shouldn't have tantrums because realistically, I, your child, it's not going to keep them from having a tantrum the next time, right? Like if I'm my five-year-old, for instance, probably knows that a tantrum is not a desirable behavior. Um, but if I were to have that conversation with my two or three-year-old, it actually wouldn't make any difference at all because they wouldn't remember the next time that they were angry, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't right. help to change um, that interaction or that behavior. Yeah, and it might not help that much with your five-year-old. Uh, so you, you want to consider dealing with tantrums as a project. You want to start decreasing the frequency. It's, it's rare that we can stomp them out all at once. It, it, it has happened, but uh, you want to think of this as something, I'm going to do the right thing so that the tantrums, our frequency and intensity is going down over the weeks and months. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I wanted to um, just ask about one other thing that you mentioned. You mentioned if you do a good veto and you decide that the kind of checkout is the strategy that you're going to use once a tantrum has started. You said one of the worst things that you can do is try to get down and talk to a tantruming child. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's really two parts of that. One is what you were talking about before, and that is in their emotional state, the reasons that you're presenting mean nothing. The second thing is your tone of voice it's very likely that your tone of voice is going to have a whimpering, pleading, helpless, anxious quality that is like pouring gasoline on a fire, I guarantee you. Uh, so it's those two things. The reasons are useless. The tone of voice aggravates the whole thing. And you'll see it if you see it in public, kids tantruming in a grocery store, the parent tries to talk to them about it. Just makes, it makes everything uh, 
five times worse than it was before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that kind of, as a parent, removing yourself from the situation a little bit can be so helpful for that reason, because it allows the child sort of the space to feel their feelings and to kind of work through that. The analogy um, that I read one time was that for kids, feelings are, are sort of like going into a tunnel, right? So as a parent, you don't want to try to pull them back out of the tunnel. The way that they learn to deal with their feelings is they ride those feelings all the way through the tunnel until they come out the other side. And so, you know, sort of stepping away gives them the space to sort of ride those feelings out, ride that aggravation out, and then sort of come back to a calmer place. I think that's a good, good way of thinking about it. All right, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Phelan. This has been so helpful. If you want to go a little bit deeper into the topic of tantrums and how to handle them, Dr. Phelan is going to be doing a free seminar on tantrums next week. We'll go ahead and drop the registration link for that on our Facebook page, and it will also be in our upcoming email newsletter. So if you're not already signed up for those, head on over to 123magic.com and get signed up. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon.